welcome to this spw online workshop and today we are going to uh, complete our workshop on basic photography uh, so it will be camera settings uh, and composition techniques one of the composition techniques i have for today's uh, schedule and welcome again i will be the presenter sumit dhupar okay just give you a brief introduction of myself uh, my name is sumit dhupar i am portrait food and still life product photographer uh, i like to do a lot of uh, you know artistic style photography so whenever you see my work you will find it some artistic touch is there in all the genres so whatever the photography i'm doing so i want to show my subject uh, in the in artistic way the beauty of the subject uh, should be showing in artistic way that's my aim always and uh, i like to cry i love to do a uh, different perspective so find some new creative ways to see the same subject uh, in a creative manner so that's my specialty and i live in pune city i am in maharashtra so india i've started all these my photography workshop expeditions uh, in feb 2019 so since then i'm just continuing and uh, because of covid i you know, i initiated the spw online uh, stream so i'm doing all the online courses uh, under spw online workshop so you can find on my website all the information about it I'm offering all the services through my website sumitphotoworld.com. You can visit my portfolio. I can see that what kind of work I am doing, and you can always reach me on the email address. So, uh, SPW Expedition is my venture where I am doing all these photography workshop and courses. Uh, I also have Smith for the World YouTube channel. You can check my channel. You find something useful there or do. SPW Photogram, SPW Fine Art. So these are my ventures. I'm working on the back end. Uh, fine Art uh, for Fine Art, I have my dedicated section in the website. You can find my some selected for images. Uh, we can see the creations. You can you can buy if you want. Uh, so everything is there on my website. On the social media, you can search me with the handle Sumit Photo World. So anywhere you will find Sumit Photo World, and it'll be myself only. So let me just give you brief uh, introduction on my YouTube channel. So it is Sumit Photo World. You can search on the YouTube. I have three playlists: SPW Launch, SPW Expedition, and BTS. So behind the scenes. Uh, so this is my playlist where I am including all the behind the scenes, whatever new project assignment I'm doing. I try to complete behind the scene there. SPW Expedition. I'm, I'm including all the recorded session, image gallery there. even the basic introduction photography workshop whatever i've done in the past i have recorded i have published there you can refer because all the workshops i do not prepare any script thing so you'll find the content a little, little different uh, in in uh, all the sessions including today so spw launch i have this playlist where i'm putting all the post processing editing workflow in different kind of photography how i use my editing uh, skills so you can see there and if you want me to create any special video which, which will be helpful for you you can give me feedback you can suggest and i'll definitely work on that to create a new video this is scheduled for today's workshop it will be 60 minutes session and we'll be having q and a session at the end so all participants allowed these are just simple rules uh, you can ask questions in the middle but uh, make sure the question is around the topic what we are discussing on the screen and participants allowed uh, for video and audio so you can turn on video if you want but uh, it's up to it's all your interest so you can you want you can turn it on keep your keep add your questions in the chat box if you just add your question in the chat box we will uh, discuss in the q and a session so we'll be having uh, that uh, only the q and a session for the questions uh, anything around the photography we'll discuss in detail okay let's start so to, first topic is how dslr camera works so you can see a uh, two diagrams two uh, photos of the dslr components you can see on the screen uh, image on the left side is the dslr when we are not shooting where we are just viewing through the viewfinder and you can see the components inside there are a lot of components lens reflex mirror matte focusing screen pentaprism eyepiece focal plane shutter sensor and the lights so how light travels we can see through the diagram when light enters through the lenses it reaches the reflex mirror so reflex mirror it will be always on 45 degree angle so because it's allowing or it's converting horizontal line to into vertical so it can reach through the 
penta prism section so penta prism section is designed just to make sure the when right reaching on the pent in the penta prism it's converting vertical line into horizontal so it can pass through the view viewfinder that's how we see the frame uh, through the viewfinder and you can see uh, there is a blue strip line so the blue line is a, a shutter plane so it's so when we press shutter release button it's open up and you can see the strip line red at the back it's a sensor where image getting recorded so at the moment of shooting if you see a reflex mirror just going up so it's always on 45 degree angle but when we press shutter release button to complete the exposure it will open up it will go into the 90 degree position and shutter plane you can see it's open it's allowing light to reach the sensor directly so uh, the longer the time the uh, shutter release shutter plane keep open or remain open it will allow the exposure getting recorded on the sensor that's how a image getting recorded on the sensor so you can uh, all the whatever the described here in the uh, text it's the same what i've uh, what i've explained you so anytime you can refer these slides in the recorded session you can read it through how mirrorless camera works so we'll just try to understand that uh, how it's different between uh, compared to the dslr because nowadays we are talking about mirrorless camera so it's better to have some understanding of the basic components uh, the why it's uh, making a huge noise in the market uh, let's see the diagram here so if you see the diagram for the mirrorless camera it's having lesser components compared to dslrs so what is what we have in the mirrorless camera we have lens we have shutter shutter plane is there we have sensor image sensor is there and this is a new member on the ninth number it's electronic viewfinder so this is the key difference or the key we can say the major improvement in the mirrorless camera uh, it's additional so that's why the mirrorless camera is a unique uh, on its own in the mechanism so mirrorless uh, system is more simpler than the dslr here the sensor is directly exposed to the light. The gen this generates a live preview of the scene directly to the electronic viewfinder. So whatever you see through the viewfinder, it's going to capture, it's going to create the same frame. So when you press, press a shutter release button, it'll just open the shutter plane like in the DSLR uh, mechanism. So it just allow the light to reach the sensor and complete the capture. So whatever you see uh, on the screen uh, through the viewfinder and the mirrorless camera, you'll get the same quality of the work there. Uh, the same exposure you will see. So benefits of mirrorless camera. We'll just try to understand the key benefits of mirrorless camera. It's more compact because it's having a small sensor. Uh, so camera, small sensor means it needs a small body to uh, host that sensor, making the mirrorless camera easier to carry like a pointed shoot camera it's quite uh, easy to carry mirrorless camera compared to dslr electronic viewfinder evf final image preview appears directly onto the screen uh, onto the image sensor offering a live view which then displays on the rear lcd screen this image preview allows you to adjust the settings like exposure brightness saturation and contrast before taking your shot so before you even click complete the exposure you'll click the shutter release button you can just see that how the exposure will be you can adjust all these settings exposure brightness saturations contrast everything you can adjust there and after completing shot you'll see the same quality of work you are getting image stabilization with lightweight the camera is less prone to shaking so image quality is sharp and clear so it's really uh, we can say that one touch when you're carrying a lightweight body of the camera you will be having more control on the device while doing handheld photography so image quality will be definitely improved uh, silent mechanism fewer moving parts inside the camera also means uh, less noise so when we have less components inside the body you will see that it's making less noise uh, you can you can if you have experienced dslr you can experience uh, mirrorless camera and you will find a lot of difference in terms of noise inside the device higher shooting speed so with better focusing capabilities for contrast detection and high shutter speeds mirrorless models makes it easier for photographers to capture a faster rate so 
it's a combination of both that it's a mechanism that contrast detection with high shutter speed it's very easy and it's really improved the burst mode the shutter uh, the capability of capturing the images in burst it's really improved in mirrorless camera now we'll understand the key differences in both the devices so because if we understand the key differences uh, we'll be able to take a decision that if we really want to go for mirrorless camera or not Mirrorless cameras are more lightweight, so that's advantage in with the mirrorless camera. Mirrorless cameras offer real-time previews of exposure and contrast. So anytime if you have a device which giving you real-time preview of the images which you are going to capture, it's always advantage. So that's a benefit of mirrorless camera. Mirrorless cameras have shorter battery life due to EVF. So this is very critical. So if you are carrying mirrorless camera, so you must have a backup battery always with you. When you, are when you are going to spend a whole day with the camera on the field, you must have an extra backup battery. So that's the benefit of, uh, we can say the DSLR with the compared to mirrorless camera, they have good battery back, uh, battery lifetime, or uh, you, can you can say that it's uh, consuming lesser battery compared to mirrorless camera you can survive i have nikon d750 and most of the time uh, i complete my workshop with a single battery so very rarely i used to uh, very rarely i've taken out my second battery out so i carry backup battery just for a uh, we can say the option where i'm doing a lot of long exposure so i feel that i i can lose a battery the, so i always carry one backup but still i never used uh, very rarely used Mirrorless cameras are costly and budget DSR will offer the entry level photographer more value than a budget mirrorless camera. So again, if you, you are new to photography, you are looking to buy a DSLR and you are getting really confused that if you go for mirrorless camera or not. So uh, it depends on the budget. Uh, if you are going for a budget mirrorless camera, I advise you to go for a budget DSLR because it will give you a lot of, uh, we can say that features which will not, not uh, be available in a mirrorless uh, budget device. So budget dslr is really really uh, we can say that uh, advantage for you uh, compared to budget dslr budget mirrorless camera uh, which will be uh, having lesser uh, features compared to a dslr so that's advantage with the dslr mirrorless cameras offer fewer accessories uh, they are still lacking in their selection of attachments and lens mounts so they are still developing uh, DSLRs it's a really developed technology and uh, they have a lot of options uh, from different third-party companies uh, have options to uh, provide their pro we can say the accessories for different manufacturers of DSLRs mirrorless cameras shoot faster particularly when it comes to uh, continuous shooting a bust of images so you understand the bust of images uh, you understand this concept what is bust of images okay let me explain the bust of images is a tech is a feature in a dslr camera where you just hold the shutter play shutter release button for amount of time and it will create it will capture burst of images so in nikon it's a 10 images if you hold the, the shutter release button uh, for some time, it'll keep capture the images until it reaches the count. You can you can change the uh, bust of uh, images count. Uh, you can set it in the DSLR. In Canon, it's a six. The number of six photos it'll capture in the bust uh, mode, and uh, it's a really improved in mirrorless camera because of the new technology. Uh, the probability of uh, getting detailed or the sharp images really enhanced. Uh, in mirrorless camera uh, just for example if you are using a dslr uh, you can get uh, 10 photos in the bust mode and out of 10 it will be six or seven images you will see that coming in good detail uh, sharpness will be there but uh, if you are using mirrorless camera the probability will increase and it will be around eight and nine images out of 10 you will see coming in good quality that's the difference we have in mirrorless camera so it's an advantage when someone having mirrorless camera Mirrorless cameras offers more image stabilization. So lack of a mirror mechanism means mirrorless cameras offer more image stabilization and less shaky photos. So if you have a lightweight camera body, it's always advantage because you can carry it for a longer time on hand and handheld photography really demands a lot of control on the device. So you have to have very st uh, stable, uh, we can say stability. Uh, we'll have come in the coming slide, we'll understand how we can hold the device 
with the more stability but again i feel the body the camera body is lightweight so you it's advantage and you can definitely get better image quality uh, when the you have less so uh, you can see that shaky hands or you are more stable with the device handheld mirrorless cameras have a smaller sensor size than the dslr so this is really critical critical point uh, the difference it's a huge because this makes them less ideal for low light so if your mirrorless camera you have you may struggle with the low light condition but in the, the dslr having bigger uh, camera image sensor so it is a kind of advantage for the dslr they can manage in the low light situation compared to uh, mirrorless camera mirrorless camera have a less accurate autofocus system so you have to understand this point so autofocus system of mirrorless camera uses contrast detection rather than phase detection so it cannot measure the distance between the lens and the subject as accurately as a dslr can so you need to understand this that uh, autofocus system is really developed really we can say that uh, mature in a dslr device it can accurately calculate the distance between the subject and the lens so and mirrorless camera uh, they they are working in different technology so it's a contrast detection and they really rely on good lighting i should say so something at the if, if uh, it's they are not uh, we can say that the technology what they have for the contrast detection it's not equipped enough or uh, it's not developed that way that it can detect uh, the distance accurately compared to dslr so that's why DSLR leading in the market. So it's still a DSLR in front. And let's see uh, in the future how it will happen. So now we'll understand the exposure triangle. So exposure triangle is the term anytime we want to learn photography skills uh, and we talk about camera settings. So exposure triangle always come into our mind. So exposure triangle, when we say triangle, it means some three components are we are talking about. So in the in, in the field of photography, it's a aperture, shutter speed and ISO. So these three camera and lens control work together to regulate the amount of light that makes it to the camera sensor. Aperture and shutter speed, uh, it's regulate, it, they regulate the light, how, it's, uh, how it is reaching the sensor. With the aperture and shutter speed, you can control that flow. And the sensitivity of camera sensor is uh, controlled by ISO because you must have heard that we can raise ISO and it will allow more light. So you can see the diagram here. If you raise ISO, it's uh, get showing the brighter part. So it's, it's making the image brighter. And uh, if you see that uh, shutter speed, if you lower the shutter speed, image will be brighter. So if you higher, if you make the shutter speed high, the image will be less brighter. It will stop the light. And in terms of aperture, if you see the F number, if it's small, we call it as a large aperture. So the small F number will give you more light. The image will be brighter. If you're on the high F number, F22 like this, so small will be whole. It's blocking the light, stopping the light allowing less light to reach the sensor its image will be darker so you need to have good light condition to work with a, a small aperture shutter speed we'll just uh, try to understand the shutter speed definition here shutter speed is the length of time that the camera shutter remain open and allow light to reach the sensor so most of the photographers will call this as exposure time because it's a, it's exposure uh, which is uh, being calculated or being captured and the how long that uh, uh, exposure being captured so we call this as exposure time so one by four thousand to one by two thousand uh, it's a very high shutter speed uh, now most now we have some professional device which supports one by eight thousand also to freeze the fast moving objects. 1 by 250 to 1 by 60 these uh, shutter speed we call as uh, for good for general photos uh, even someone walking slowly gently you can capture with 1 by 250 1 by 2 to 1 by 30 consider this long exposure to capture motion blur in consistent movement so when we say consistent movement it means uh, some uh, we can say the element or the uh, uh, we can say subject it's doing movements so like the waterfall like a wheel uh, they are doing consistent movement so you can uh, you can work within the shutter speeds one by two to one by thirty and you can create different creative effects uh, most of the time uh, when when I capture waterfall uh, I'll have a shutter speed somewhere around one by six one by eight that works for me. 
but a bit but uh, this all depends the light condition two to four or ten seconds so this considered to be the long exposure uh, to paint the, with the light so whenever i do light painting i used to work within that shutter speed stars uh, capturing stars you need a high shutter speed and fireworks uh, in firework days uh, uh, during festival you can use the long shutter speed and long exposure and you will see the creative trail effects from the fireworks and we can also make the river water of the river like a glass so if you are going to the river you can around the we can say the evening time when the light is almost uh, gone you can you can check the shutter speed and you will be surprised how the image will come on the long exposure now we'll see that just uh, example here for fast shutter speed if you see that uh, fast shutter speed it's freezing the moment so it uh, person walking it just freeze that moment uh, everything look quite static on slow shutter speed it's uh, just blurring the motion so anything in motion will be blurred uh, shutter speed a uh, control uh, button on the camera uh, it'll be uh, it, it is from Nikon so you can see the button like this and when we have on S it's a shutter priority mode uh, shutter speed values would be somewhere between 30 seconds uh, you can see the single digit it's 30 seconds to 1 by 4000 so but some devices supports 1 by 8000 also but whenever we do a change from one to others uh, we can say that step or the shutter speed we call this as a one step change so anything one step uh, if you are increasing shutter speed one step it'll we can say half the amount of light coming to the sensor if you are going below if you are uh, we can say reducing the shutter speed going to the long exposure uh, it'll double the amount of light coming to the sensor so that's how it works that's the concept handheld shutter speed so the rule of thumb states that when shooting handheld use shutter speeds equal or faster than the one divided by your focal length. So whatever the focal length of lens you are using, uh, you can you can calculate the, what would be the handheld shutter speed. Like for 300 mm, it'll be 1 by 300, but there is no shutter speed of 300, it'll be 1 by 320. So that is uh, something where you don't have VR, vibration reduction or image stabilization feature is not there. But if you have a stabilization, vibration reduction uh, feature available in the camera, in the lens, then you may have you may have the option to go even lower one or two stop lower shutter speed and you can still manage with the handheld but just for example for 50 mm it will be 1 by 50 but there is no shutter speed of 1 by 50 so we have to we have something equal or faster so 1 by 60 shutter speed will will go for but i am just uh, reminding you it's a uh, shutter speed we need without vr function without vibration reduction and image stabilization but if you have image stabilization, you can uh, manage with the even lower shutter speed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how do I know what focal length I am using? Is it same as the aperture? Focal like length. Can... Focal length uh, is uh, written on the lens. Right. It's. Uh, okay. If you uh, can you see this? There is a. There are some numbers on the lens. Yeah. Eighteen to fifty-five is the numbers I have. So, so these are focal length only. 18 to 55 is the focal length. Right. So whenever I zoom in or zoom out, I guess the number changes from. Yes. To yes. So at any point that, of time, what would be my focal length? So what, what, what if you, you are in the middle, you need to see what is the focal length. Uh, you can capture image. You can see the overview data in the image oh. and you will see the what was the focal length it was in the image. Okay. For the accurate focal length calculation, but uh, you can uh, always assume that if you are having 18 to 55, you can be on always 1 by 60 shutter speed. You need, you no need to worry about. So any time you will be on the highest shutter speed. Okay. Okay. Got it. I think I got it. Yeah. Okay, uh, so this is DL, DSLR handheld techniques. So you can see the images here. These are the examples that how we should hold the DSLR device. So the knee band technique, it means we are uh, using our knee as a platform to hold the DSLR device. And we need something to make our, uh, we can say posture more stable. So when we have stable posture, there'll be less prone, uh, that will be less prone to shake 
and we have more probability to get sharp images. Uh, the elbow plant, again, it's the concept we are planting our elbow on some hard surface, you, any object you find which is uh, giving you opportunity to plant the elbow, you can use that for that technique. The T-Rex is the traditional method of holding. So just for example, if uh, I'm holding the camera like this on my hand, so I should make uh, my left hand as a platform to hold it. I can make my front finger and the thumb free so I can move the focusing ring. If you are working with manual focus, uh, you, can use, you can use the front finger and thumb to uh, move the focusing ring. This is a, a traditional method of holding, but you have to make sure that your elbow is always stick to your body. So the more stick, the more near to the body, it will be more stability you will have. And uh, thought strap is something new, so we can, uh, if you have a strap on your device, you can just wear it and if you stretch it, it'll create some tension on the strap, it'll make sure that it'll be less shaky. So these are the techniques you can use, how you can utilize and you will see that uh, your photograph will definitely improve. Now we'll talk about aperture. So definition is of, uh, of the aperture is the, the aperture f-stop controls the amount of light reaching the sensor through the lens. So it's a, sometimes we see this as the eye of the lens. The aperture size will regulate the depth of field. So just for example, uh, if you are working with low aperture like f1.4, something around like 1.8 also, it will create a bokeh effect and good for low light. Bokeh effect is something when some lights behind uh, in the background, they are creating round circles. We call that as a bokeh. So in low light, good uh, low light condition, when there are some uh, artificial lights in the background, and uh, they'll, be they'll give more effect compared to some natural lights. You can get it in the natural environment too. Depends how the background have shiny objects behind and uh, f2.2 to f5.6 uh, so it's good for portrait photography and sports photography so they consider to have enough depth of field it will allow yourself it will allow you to capture the whole subject and even on the portrait it will make sure that your portrait face is in good focus so for just for thumb roll for portrait uh, we advise to have uh, f5.6 so f5.6 anyhow on the almost on every lens it will make sure that you will have minimum six inches of uh, depth of field so it will make sure if you're focusing on the eye so anytime you are taking photo of a living subject we should take a focus from the eye it will make sure something in front uh, uh, having in good focus like nose and something behind like ear should uh, it'll be in good focus so that's how we make sure that portrait is coming good and f8 to f16 good for landscape uh, to get de increased depth of field so whenever we talk about landscape it means we want everything to be enough visible we can identify what is inside in the each corner of the landscape so f8 to f16 is uh, recommended for the landscape photography f16 to f32 good for long exposure and create starburst effect uh, with small focal length. So if you have some lens around 55, like you said, you have 18 mm, 18 to 55 mm. You can test it. You can set the aperture to f16 in a night condition, find some street lights and test it out. You will see with f16 and exposure or uh, with the long, ex and long exposure, like uh, two seconds, three seconds, you will see that the more, uh, it will be some point that you will see the starburst effect coming from the light. Now we'll just uh, have a little more study on the depth of field. So what is depth of field? The distance in front or behind. Uh, the focus point that appears to be in the focus is referred to as depth of field. So uh, just for example, if we are having a focus right in the middle, something in front, something in behind will be in focus. So that's uh, in total we call as a depth of field. So just to remember these terms, large F number is small aperture so people sometimes get confused so i just make this slide very clear small f number is large aperture so when we say small aperture it means the hole in the camera we this is the aperture and the camera and uh, in the lens uh, and this is very small you can the hole is very small so it means is it on small aperture when what will when it will happen uh, when we are using high f number 
So large F number you are using, it will increase depth of field. So you can see the image and everything looking in focus from front from front, front to back, everything looks to be in good focus. But we are when we are in large aperture, the hole will be quite bigger, eye will be quite bigger, it will allow more light, but at the cost of depth of field, depth of field will be reduced. You can see if you focus in the middle, some boxes in front, some boxes behind are out of focus. Sometimes we use this as for creative purpose, just to make more artistic image. But this is how we should uh, uh, we should be aware that that what we are trying to achieve with the aperture. Okay, uh, now let's talk about aperture values uh, for dial button on the camera. Uh, it's an image from Nikon, and when we switch to A mode, it's aperture priority. So that uh, when we are in aperture priority, we can just work with the aperture numbers only. So aperture numbers will be uh, like this, as low as 1.4, as high as f32. So we can categorize these numbers in different, uh, we can say the category of aperture, like when we are in f1.4, it's very large aperture. When we are at f2.8, it's considered to be large. And when we are in the middle, somewhere around f5.6, it's considered to be medium aperture. f11, we call this as a small aperture. f22 is really very, very, very small aperture, f32. But again, whenever we are change, making any change in the setting in the aperture, we call this change as one step. So as we discussed in the shutter speed, the same way aperture, if you are increasing shutter speed by one step, we are changing from 5.6 to f8. It means it's a half, it's making this a light half, which is reaching the sensor, stopping the light. But when we are reducing the f number, it will allow double amount of light reaching the sensor. So it increase the brightness on, on your image. So whenever you are struggling with the image, either you can lower the shutter speed or you can lower the f number. So whenever we make a selection of lower F number, it'll make the image lighter, but at the cost of small depth of field, when we make bigger F number, uh, it'll allow a lot of uh, uh, good enough depth of field, uh, large depth of field, but it'll make the image darker. ISO sensitivity. So is a measure of the camera's ability to capture light. So it's a, it's a ability, it's a mechanism uh, in the camera which allows to sense the light. Digital camera converts the light that falls on the image sensor into electrical signals for processing. So when light falls on the image sensor, it converts the into the electrical signals for processing and that's how the image getting recorded on the sensor. ISO sensitivity is raised by amplifying the signal. In other words, if ISO sensitivity is raised from 100 to 200, uh, if you don't change the aperture, you will see that you are getting double shutter speed. So, so that's how you can take benefit of ISO. So when you are struggling with the shutter speed, you can raise the ISO and see that shutter speed getting improved. Uh, if you you can you can you can avoid camera blur. So like as as I said, you should have at least handheld shutter speed so somewhere around the focal length you should have the shutter speed so you can get it by raising the iso and that's why the people say that iso sensitivity should be raised if the lighting is poor so just go for the higher iso when the there is not enough light no light low light uh, flash uh, photography when lighting is poor you can use a flash to light the portrait uh, you can see the image below so image on the left is taken with the flash image flash always have limited range so there is nothing like that if uh, any anything far can be captured using flash nothing like that so all flash have their range and uh, the subject should be within that range to get uh, we can say it completely lit up uh, by the flash so you can see the image on the left, it's, you can see the subject is quite uh, good uh, light having on that. But uh, the ambient in the background, it's dark. So that's the limitation with the flash. But if you, if you see image on the right, it's captured without flash, but with high ISO sensitivity. You can see almost uh, all the ambient light got captured. So that's how you can take benefit of high ISO. If you are looking to capture ambient light, you can, you can rely on the ISO. Noise at high ISO. So if you raise ISO, that will introduce some kind of grainy effect in your image. So make sure uh, when you are raising ISO, uh, you are raising enough that uh, you will not uh, degrade the image quality.
always test the ISO by taking same subject photo at different different ISO level in the same light condition and you will see that what is your device capability most of the time it's around uh, low light condition you can test it and you can see that well, at what point uh, the grainy effect is uh, we can say that enough that that uh, making your photo unusable it's too much in the in image you can you can uh, just find a sweet spot for the ISO that what is the good value for your device for the lens and you know you can always stick around that uh, to get better quality for pages so uh, the raising ISO sensitivity can introduce a type of image artifact known as noise we call that green effect as a noise and making it semi grainy raising iso sensitivity amplifies the electrical signals which also amplifies any noise in the signals as a result the higher iso sensitivity the more obvious the effects of noise on your photographs that's the same is true for all digital cameras so all digital cameras use uh, it, it applies to all digital cameras this uh, you can say the theory we recommend that you raise iso sensitivity only as high as needed to avoid blur so always just keep this as a your we can say that a note uh, something to remember always uh, you can just raise the iso but just raise uh, enough which you need uh, to avoid camera blur so you will get good shutter speed just stop don't raise do not raise further you may get better or we can say that further enhanced exposure but at the cost of noise so you will see a lot of noise so try to uh, avoid that in this image, you can see the 12,800 having a lot of grainy effect, but on the ISO 100, it's quite clean image. ISO sensitivity can be set manually by the photographer or automatically by the camera. You have option to set the ISO on the auto. Most of the time we work with auto ISO when we are doing bird photography or street photography, where we can't uh, really uh, go back to the settings uh, almost every time and see that how this uh, Oh, we can see the exposure coming so we can work with the auto ISO just to make sure that we are getting good exposure almost all the time and even sometimes the green image coming we can we can manage with that by converting into black and white now we'll just see the camera simulator so we have understood the uh, three aspects or the components of exposure triangle now we'll just try to do a practical kind of so you can do the same uh, on your device Let's do this on the uh, this website. This is a simulator website where we have option of uh, uh, testing all these modes, uh, shooting modes, shutter priority, aperture priority, and manual. So if you see this, we are in the shutter priority mode and the only settings we can change is shutter speed. This is the component we can change here. So if you see, whenever I'm changing the shutter speed, it's adjusting the aperture. It's not doing any change in the ISO, it's just adjusting the aperture. The higher ap uh, shutter speed, it's uh, making the aperture lower F number. But if I raise the ISO, you can see the effect on the aperture. It's allowing me to get the desired aperture. And that's what we can in aperture priority. If I, in the aperture priority, I can only change the aperture and it's it's just changing that counter, uh, that shutter speed, just to make sure the exposure will be optimal. You can see the effect on the image. So let's change that uh, ISO. So if I raise the ISO, you can see that how it's impacting the shutter speed. So just for example, if you are working in a light condition, which is uh, not good, uh, you are just for example, if I'm just uh, on F16, but I want uh, a good shutter speed. So what I can do, I can raise the shutter speed. I can raise the ISO and you can see it's allowing me to uh, have ISO uh, shutter speed of one by 60 when I'm using ISO 200. If I'm on ISO 50, it's a uh, shutter speed is one by 50. It's quite low. That's how you can work with the uh, ISO, even in the shutter priority or aperture priority. But when we are in manual, we have control on all the aspects, all the three aspects we have in, uh, in our control. So we can make any combination of settings. So it's not doing, it's not making change in other aspects. So all we have to manage to create good combination and it's, it's up to us how we want the creative results from our image in a manual mode. 
I always advise to take a test photo, record short, something like that with the P mode and see what are the camera settings are coming in the P mode. Just feed in the same settings in the manual mode and you will see the same amazing result is coming. That's how you get confidence of working in manual mode. Now we are in composition technique. So today's composition technique is line and sport. So what is line and sport? It's a it's a kind of symmetric uh, composition technique where we are dividing our frame in our image in the middle with a line and you can see that it's identical in the both sides. So it's a kind of uh, creating an image with a mirror effect. We can see that we can we have draw a line and we can identify the points which are quite identical on the uh, point on the other side of the line so that's what we we can achieve with this most of the time is the reflection photography we do this uh, we apply this composition techniques line and symmetry but sometimes you can find the same in a different different uh, we can say that genre of photography and even the different subjects you can identify we'll see a lot of, lot of examples in coming slides line and point so this is just one example uh, of my glass photography you can see the symmetrical framing it's a shapes and the subject very minimal composition so if you do draw a line in middle you can identify the points so that's how we use this uh, line in point uh, composition technique this is architecture so i found this architecture as a good example of a line in point it's a shape and subject again it's a minimal composition and framing is symmetrical you can find you can see that it's like how we are matching the things uh, on the both sides this is the image i captured in a fun fair and uh, i found this as a good example it's a motion effect uh, again it's a shape and subject symmetrical framing so every time you divide a frame in the with a line in the middle you can see that some points are they are quite uh, we can say the mirror effect you can see in the image this is from a light painting uh, photography workshop. So anytime you see image or which or anytime you create image which is having line in point or symmetric framing, you will see they have we can say enhanced visual impact on the viewer. They look more amazing because we are applying some composition techniques there. In nature, it's very easy to find out. You can see how identical it is. Like you can you can apply this with any flower and you will find that they are quite symmetrical that's the nature i captured this during my nature photography workshop and it was really unique and it was really perfect example of symmetrical how that leaf having pointers around it and you can count it so four there four here and it's just a perfect example of symmetrical that's it what we have so i'm just i'm having my special photo work and online course so in the month of april uh, if you are in Pune, you like to join me, you can join my outdoor session. It's on 8th April and I have the same basic photography introduction workshop. If you, if you think that you can work on yourself, you can have some question to be discussed in the next session. You can just uh, do some practice and all I prepare some questions for the next workshop. You can join again. So it's a free entry for both and anytime you can join, I have my session one for the morning, one for the evening. So which time suits you, you can join that. So you can take benefit of it. Outdoor photography workshop. I'm doing outdoor photography workshop on birds, uh, street and nature. So they are already scheduled for the coming week. I have birds photography workshop on 18th March. On 25th, I have street photography workshop. On 15th, I have 15th April, I have nature photography workshop so all are scheduled uh, and you can find the registration link uh, on my website you can register there under workshops i i designed a special online workshop so it's a kind of a dreaming content what i've done so it's a four hour workshop all about photography so the aim for this workshop is just to make sure even the beginners if they have camera bought yesterday they can join and or if someone is looking to uh, find the right way in the photography field uh, it's having enough information it'll let you know that which device which equipment you should buy to develop your skills and uh, what could be the genre of photography you want to pursue and which lens is good for which kind of photography 
all kind of these questions are covered you can just refer the details in the uh, registration link and i have given all i've mentioned all the points what i'm going to discuss i'm uh, covering the portrait i cover i'm covering the landscape so almost all kind of uh, topics i've included how the we can how we can control the light and all in the studio in the natural so everything i covered there so if you like to join you want to develop your skills in the photography it's perfect for beginners and above again i have two sessions one for the morning one for the evening so which time suits you you can join in depends on uh, your location if you are in a country where the time suits you for the evening you can join in or else you can join in the morning session photo editing online workshop i have photo editing online workshop for lightroom and photoshop these are the tools i'm using for my workflow for post production production and uh, these are read the tools which helps me to give a final touch on my images so again it's a 4 hour workshop uh, for both uh, it's on 26th of march you can join in or well, for lightroom it's morning session for photoshop it's evening session again it's a beginner set about so no need to think about that if you are really having skills to use those uh, softwares anyone can uh, Let's start from the day one. I have a link to download the trial softwares from the uh, registration link. Uh, there is there is a link to download trial softwares. You can download. You can use it for free for limited amount of uh, limited period of time, and you can take a benefit of. And you'll see that how it's helping you to improve the quality. Advanced photography workshop. I have a couple of advanced photography workshop where one online session is for glassware photography, where I am sharing all the experience, knowledge, what I've done in the terms of glass photography. You can see my portfolio, what kind of work I've done. I'm going to illustrate. I'm going. I'm going to explain all the work, previous works, how I created those images, and what are the basics uh, to capture reflection. Uh, and I have to avoid the reflection on the shiny elements, uh, subjects. So we'll learn all that. It's a four-hour workshop on 16th April. It'll be online session. Again, beginners and above can join for light painting photography. It's on May 20th. So previously, I've done that workshop on metal tickery in Pune, and I really, I was really uh, amazed the results what I got at that location. It's perfect for light painting. And again, beginners and above can join. No need to have any previous experience uh, for similar kind of photography. Portfolio building events. I am having two portfolio building events right now. The one for portrait, I am still working on the content. So soon it will be published. Uh, but uh, for product and for food photography, I have these workshop for 29th and 30th April. So aim for these workshop is just to give you enough images you can build your portfolio on the uh, product or food photography. So. Uh, I'm going to give you uh, opportunity to create images, professional-like photos from these workshops. Uh, this will be full day workshop uh, in a photo studio setup. It will be in Pune. So, if you have uh, any any question, any concern, any point which you want to discuss, you can directly contact me, and uh, we can we can uh, really uh, work it out. So, whatever the points you have, we can work it out. Now, thank you so much for your participation. Now we are in the QA session. Uh, you can always send me queries on my email address info at sumitphotoworld.com. I'm going to stop the screen share and I'll be available here for your questions. So uh, if you have questions prepared, we can discuss. And I'll just stop this uh, session only when uh, you say that you have no questions and everything will be good. I'll also share the feedback of link your name uh, could you could you could you just type in your name in the chat and the question so it'll good for me so because i have to prepare some presentation kind of for all these questions so it'll help someone else referring those okay how's the legal the scenes uh, recording street photography yeah that's that's the aim of my street photography workshop i'll give you enough knowledge enough background that you will be comfortable with your camera on the street uh, even I was having online workshop also, 
uh, for the street photography where it was only for the content and uh, if you want i can I can re reintroduce that session for street photography but in outdoor street photography workshop i start my workshop with the camera settings with all these uh, general questions on street photography because when people coming for the first time they also get uh, quite uh, uh, feel awkward feel scary that how it will be but uh, my main aim is that i'll make you comfortable uh, with your camera in your hand and i'll tell you how we approach the subject how we'll find the scene how we'll capture how we'll create our compositions all things i covered during the workshop so it's a five hours workshop i'll make sure you will you will be more than confident uh, when you leave that workshop you you will be enough confident you can just ask your friend to, to join you and you can come anytime on the street with the camera there more are some than, yeah more than the confidence part like uh, isn't it a violation of privacy if you are taking pictures and people are there are yes, so there are some rules like uh, anything on the street is in the boundary of uh, uh, not within the privacy if someone need privacy they need to be in their own compound so anything on the street it's very much legal you can capture but you have to be on the street it's not like that uh, you are on the street and uh, you are capturing someone inside their compound somewhere in, like uh, someone in the hotel room if they are on the window you can capture them from the street and it's totally legal but if you are putting you you are using some ways to uh take a photo inside the hotel room so okay. that's uh, some kind of you are uh, breaching the privacy anything on the from the street while standing on the street the view uh, you can capture that's totally legal what more do you recommend for beginner uh, coming from auto mode shutter priority or versus aperture priority yeah again so it's our uh, need for the photo so if your priority is shutter speed so it means you need to have a shutter speed you can't come you can't compromise on that then we we'll, that's why we say this as a shutter priority when we say priority it means we are having priority on the shutter speed we can't compromise we can compromise on aperture but we, but we can't compromise on shutter speed that's a shutter priority and when you want aperture to be we can say that you have decided that you are not going to change aperture that will be aperture priority so you'll set the aperture you can manage with the shutter speed you can take a help from iso you can raise iso to get better shutter speed but again when you are in aperture priority in good light condition you don't need to worry about shutter speed so you will always get good high shutter speed when you are in good light condition but when you are in low light condition you may struggle you may see that when you are in aperture priority in low light condition shutter speed is going really low you can take a help from tripod or you have to have some uh, iso help to raise the shutter speed so that's it so it's up to you that how you want but uh, i always recommend to take a record shot with the p mode whenever you are going out in any light condition take a shot of p mode p mode is something it is creating a, a, a combination of shutter speed and aperture right so when you get that combination it keep it very simple like you go to shutter speed of 1 by 250 and aperture you go to somewhere around 5.6 so any stop so what we have understood in the simulator if you do stop if you change the shutter uh, shutter speed it will if you increase shutter speed it will lower the f number and if you decrease the shutter speed it will make the uh, aperture higher it will go in the high f number so that's yeah. what you have to do manually uh, right on the device because you know the concept one step uh, above and one step down so you know if you are allowing more light with the shutter speed by making the shutter speed lower you have to stop the light make, making aperture little uh, on the high number so that's how you make the combinations and it's quite funny it's quite a enjoyable experience when you do it first time and you will be amazed that how the results are coming yeah i am kind of sad about the results that are coming yeah so, but because you you don't know this the the small uh, bit of information missing we struggle we get uh, sometime really irritated frustrated and we just miss the basics that's what happened actually i i understood i was asking this question because uh, auto mode obviously or the p mode is the easiest to go with for a beginner because there is nothing to do yeah so but I assumed uh, that one of these modes like shutter priority or aperture might be the easier out of the two and yes yes 
P mode is something where we most of the time use P mode to create, capture, record shots to assess the light, how the light it is. Shutter priority we are going. It means you are serious enough to create a shot. We have, we are serious enough to create a frame. Then we go to shutter priority or aperture priority. But in P mode, you don't have any control. It's a camera deciding what is the better combination. But camera don't know better combination. Only photographer knows what would be the right combination. Yeah, thank you. I, okay. I do not yeah. know. <laughs> Which would be the best camera for beginners? So for best camera for beginners, it all depends on your budget. It's a question uh, from Koshal. Uh, Koshal, there is no concept of best camera for beginners. Uh, entry level camera, we say that entry level camera. It's uh, it's all depends on your budget. That if you have a budget for entry level camera, you can you can find different different reviews, compare that features what uh, each devices have. So I never make things complicated. I make things easy. Just find out what are the devices in your budget and compare their features. Even with the different manufacturers. If you are in, if you don't have any priority for a specific manufacturer, you can compare the entry level device from different manufacturers. Check their features, what they have, and you can decide for one of them. But uh, there is no concept of something like that best camera for beginners. Entry level camera we have because they are designed for beginners. Uh, that's why we call them entry level devices. So as per your budget, you can decide, you can check different, uh, we can say that YouTube tutorials are available for different uh, comparing devices, the features you can know better. And based on that, you can devise the most, the better feature you will see, uh, like uh, controlling ISO and all. So if you see that device is supporting enough feature and the same budget, you can decide for that. Okay, he also got the answer, that's cool. Okay, if uh, there is no question and if you still find some questions later on, you can always send me email on my email address info at subitfotoworld.com. I'm waiting for your feedback. If you want me to uh, do some changes in the content or you have some special suggestion or what you feel about this session, because uh, this is kind of introduction session. Uh, I'm not covering all the things because uh, for that I have my delegates uh, workshop all about photography where I'm covering end to end all about photography. But this is uh, just having enough information. It will make you comfortable with the camera settings. That's the aim of this uh, online session. I hope I'm achieving. And if you feel more confident after this session, then I'll feel good about it. Okay, I just wait for one more minute. If there is no question, we'll just conclude the session for today. And I uh, really thank you so much for joining and I, I hope uh, I was clear enough. I, uh, my information was useful enough and you'll be having more fun time with the camera in the future. <laughs>